volunteered Christine Elder. She's an avid bird watcher, traveler, and nature artist from Ben. She's been lucky to see dozens of the world's 350 plus species of hummingbirds in her travels. She works as a natural science illustrator with a focus on birds and has collaborated with state and federal agencies, conservation organizations, and scientists to create interpretive displays, publications, and books, including the Endemic Birds of the West Indies coloring book. And she's here today to talk all about hummingbirds. So please join me in welcoming Christine. Thank you so much, Paige, and thank you folks for joining us in person here in Sun River and you folks uh, watching online, hello to you too. So hi, I'm Christine Elder, and as we uh, see here on the slide, the name of my talk is Fanciful Hummingbirds and Their Feats of Light. Now we can get so the Oh, the <laughs> This is working earlier. Uh, it just moved. Oh, there it is. Wait, now I turned it off. It's like right next to her. No worries, we're all friends here. Okay, back on. Great, there. there we go. Yes, yeah, so like Paige said, November is no flight month. And so that's why I'm here to talk about the uh, avian type of flight. So, uh, as Paige said, I love birds. I'm an artist, um, I'm a traveler, and I'm going to share with you um, some fun pictures and fun facts about hummingbirds. Uh, so, I first got into hummingbirds uh, about eight years ago when I was traveling through the Caribbean and I illustrated a book um, called Endemic Birds of the West Indies. And there's over 175 species that live only in this area in the Caribbean and 16 of them are hummingbirds. So on each island, I would get to know different hummingbirds. It was the first time I saw such brilliant hummingbirds. So like the Antillean crested, and the Cuban bee hummingbird, and the Puerto Rican emerald, and the um, uh, Bahama wood star. <laughs> and so I really got inspired, and of course then I illustrated this book. So I, I also love to travel, and I love to do things called uh, birding big days. Uh, you may have watched um, the birding big year, a big year, right? So I took inspiration from that. Uh, and so I do birding big sketching days where I try to see as many birds as I can uh, in a 12 hour day in the tropics. So I did bring a bunch of my sketchbooks you can look at later on if you'd like. Uh, and I did bring the um, few copies of the endemic birds of the West Indies coloring book as well. And so a lot of my travels are related to doing sketching in a field that I can then develop into uh, finished uh, paintings. And so I like focusing on the um, really beautiful but often uh, endangered species like this, um, this uh, ornate hawk eagle I saw in Belize in January and waved albatross I saw in the uh, Galapagos. So getting back to our hummingbirds now, let's start our real presentation here. Oh, page, oh, it went away, great. <laughs> so what are we doing today in the next 60 minutes? It's a full program. So of course, since this is no flight month here at the library, we're talking about why hummingbirds excel at flight, how hummingbirds use flight, similar to, but also different from other birds, and we're gonna give you a virtual tour of tropical hummingbirds primarily because most of my traveling and sketching has been in the tropics. And this is kind of a cold and one of our first snowy days here in the beginning of winter. So I thought I'd um, virtually warm us up with some tropical um, pictures. So, you know, get out your sunglasses and your hat and your binoculars and um, we'll be inspired by some of those pictures in a little bit. Is it working or not? It's testy, but yeah. it's okay. Okay, perfect, great. So again, since we're talking about flight in general, I thought I'd just mention a couple other champions of avian flight. The uh, Arctic tern, of course, had the longest migration of any bird in the world, breeding up in the Arctic and going down to the Antarctic for a second summer. So that's like 25,000 miles that a single bird will migrate in a year. And then um, these bar-tailed godwits have one of the longest migrations of in one flight. They can go from um, Alaska down to uh, it was Tasmania. It's just a story um, on the internet about that, that one had been 
banded little bands down there, and it blew something like 4,000 miles nonstop, right? And then, of course, a lot of the uh, raptors um, have very uh, fast dives as well. But we're going to talk about hummingbirds. <laughs> so who's got hummingbird feeders in their backyard? Yeah, great, great, wonderful. And I wanted to remind you that there are hummingbirds here uh, in Oregon all year round, especially nowadays with climate change, with people um, having more feeders and don't be afraid to feed them. Um, it's not gonna stop them from migrating, but they are here year round. I've got um, the uh, Annas in my backyard enjoying my hummingbird feeders all year. I just take them in every night so they won't freeze. Because <laughs> there's nothing sadder than having a hummingbird looking through the window while you're having your co coffee in the morning and saying, hey, where's my nectar? It's frozen. <laughs> so introduction to the family, it's actually a very big family. There's over 360 species now. Um, and it's the second largest bird family behind the uh, tiger flycatchers. And so they are just in what we call the new world. Um, Central, uh, well, North America, Central America, and South America. And they reach their greatest diversity as we get right towards the equator. So that's where we're going to be showing you some really cool photos. So, for example, um, both Ecuador and Colombia have over 100 species each. So, and there's some quick sketches from um, a feeder that I'll show you in a minute. Here we go. <laughs> And I do have a lot of, of these videos on my YouTube channel at Christine Elder. I'm sure you can find it. Uh, and you can hear the audio much better there. So I'll be showing you photos naming some of these birds in a little bit. Just to give you a taste of how busy and diverse it can be in the tropics. Some of these bird watching lodges can go through 10 gallons of hummingbird nectar in a day. <laughs> Okay, and so um, just a little introduction to the family. Of course, everybody intrinsically kind of knows what a hummingbird looks like, but they, um, like I said, they are the second largest family of birds. They are only in the new world. Um, they're the tiniest birds, and uh, they have a, a very large head for their body and a large eye um, and a very big brain. So they're really smart. So they can remember where all these different flowers are in the meadows. Um, they have various types of bills, various coloration, various lengths of tails. So often the tail is uh, quite short, like this one, um, to be able to help them to uh, turn and, and break quickly. And so just some more images from my coloring book. And they, uh, the female raises the uh, young alone. She usually has uh, two eggs and two nestlings that she fledges if she's lucky. And the little nest is quite small. Has anyone here ever seen a hummingbird nest? Yeah, they're only about as big as, not much bigger than a hollowed out golf ball. And they're made of um, moss and lichens and uh, tied together uh, with uh, spider webs. And so there's just some uh, more species here. Uh, and so I mentioned some of these things already. Uh, smallest bird, small compact bodies, large head, large eye, large brain, lots of iridescent colors. And the ones in the tropics, of course, get much more diverse than the ones we have here in North America. Uh, here in Oregon, we have about seven regularly occurring species, and in all of North America, there's been up to about 25, but I think about 14 regularly, just three in North America. And so they get much more diverse in the tropics, much more by variety in the sizes and shapes um, of the bill and the coloration and the lengths of the tails. So then, specifically, why do hummingbirds excel at flight? So one reason, they have exceptionally long primary flight feathers. Uh, so they look a lot like a swift, which they're closely related to. 
and swallows. And so the longer um, these uh, wings called the primaries are, um, the more they're going to be able to, I'm sorry, the more they're going to be able to quickly, you know, bank and turn and everything. Uh, and they're kind of unique in just having 10 of these feathers, uh, as well as just 10 uh, tail feathers instead of 12, which are the songbirds. Now, they aren't the songbird, so they can't sing, um, but their feathers can sing a bit, and I'll show you that in a minute. And here's an image uh, of a, a bird I saw both live and passed away, so I was able to very closely uh, look at that structure. And again, here you see um, those really long feathers there. So yeah, they're most closely related to the Swiss uh, in an order called apodiformes, which actually means, uh, in Latin, it means without feet. <laughs> of course, they do have feet, but they're very tiny, and they can only stand on them. They can't walk on them. And Swifts are even um, worse in the, that. They can only hang from them. And you may know about the Swifts that uh, come to the um, chimney over at the Boys and Girls Club, thousands of them. And they come into that chimney every night and they hang, so sort of like a bat. <laughs> so anyway, that's their closest relative. So I made a couple of little simple graphics to help you a little bit understand the difference between um, most birds you're familiar with, like robins and warblers and, and jays in your backyard, and then hummingbirds. And what can you notice mostly that's different? What color is most different in the hummingbirds? Hmm? Yellow. The yellow, yes. So um, this is the hand right here. So we have, this is actually our thumb there. These, uh, that's homologous to our thumb. And then um, on the hand is where all those primary feathers are. So it's much longer and sturdier than other birds for being able to have that um, really strong flight and, and all those maneuvers they can do. Um, and then what do you notice about this part compared to this part? It's longer. Yeah, it's shorter. And this is, um, this is right here is the elbow, homologous to ours. Um, and unlike other birds, they, they can't move it like this. So it's really stiff and shorter. So you can imagine that that makes it a little bit um, stronger and able to handle the torque of um, being able to uh, move their wings so quickly. Um, always, almost always above 50 times per second. And it can often go up to 70 or 80 or even 200 times a second when they're diving. And, um, and then this part is a little bit more normal for both birds, that's the shoulder there. So another um, reason they're, they're good at flight is because they have a really big keel. And the keel is the flattened area, just like we have in a boat. Um, and that's the same uh, bone as our sternum here in the middle, but it comes out like this. And being so large, it has a lot of surface area for really big muscles here in red that are attached um, right here um, to be able to let that uh, wing go back and forth so quickly. And then um, actually their shoulder is a bit different from other birds. Uh, a lot more, um, um, this, this ball and socket that can be a lot more flexible than other birds. And they also move their wings in kind of more of a figure eight, whereas most birds are kind of flapping like this, they're going like this. And what that does to help them always have lift and that's why they can hover. Um, although I guess birds like kites, um, like black-tailed kite hovers maybe in a different way. I'm not sure how they do it, but um, they can't do it for as long or as fast. Um, but anyway, that, that gives them, each stroke always is giving them lift. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, and so yeah, that those, um, those qualities, those and anatomical features help them um, be able to hover, and help them to be able to fly upside down for a short amount of time, especially when they're battling each other. So they're very aggressive and very territorial and uniquely being able to fly backwards as well. And again, they use that short little tail um, to help them break and steer very quickly as well. Okay, so how do hummingbirds use flight? In similar ways, but in different ways, more specialized ways than other birds. Now, of course, not all the world's birds can fly. Penguins use their wings for uh, swimming, and ostriches and emus and cassowaries um, use their wings just for running around on the ground. <laughs> but um, hummingbirds use them in a much different way. 
So, um, of course, they use the flight for feeding. And uh, so that hovering flight we talked about where their wings are moving at least 50 times a second. And that's why they're alert. So they have to be able to hover flowers. And hummingbird flowers generally um, don't have any kind of landing platform um, like um, a bee uh, uh, flower. But they serve as very good pollinators because they can be out pollinating when it's colder and at higher elevations than insects. So um, I actually studied pollination biology during my master's degree um, in biology. And so I love that interaction between animals and plants. And so every kind of um, animal uh, that is a pollinator sort of has a certain um, flower type that it goes to, and you'll see in these pictures. So usually they're um, red or yellow or orange or pink. Um, they're usually tubular. Uh, the flower doesn't have any striping on it because um, they have very good eyesight, but they have no sense of smell. So maybe flowers don't smell. Uh, and the families of flowers would include things like mints, um, the mint here, um, snapdragons, uh, and in the tropics, things like heliconias and bromeliads, gingers, and every species of plant actually places their, their um, uh, the pollen from the anthers on a different part of the bird because the bird isn't very loyal to any one species. So it might go uh, visit a heliconia and run over to a bromeliad, and the plants don't want their nectar, I mean, their pollen mixed up. <laughs> so one species of plant might put the uh, pollen on the lower bill, another one might put it on the upper head. So then when that bird visits the next flower of that same species, it gets the pollen, which is like the male sperm, um, to the right place on the next plant. Isn't that interesting? So um, now, of course, hummingbirds don't just drink nectar or um, the sweet, sugary stuff we put in our feeders, right? Um, a lot of their calories does come from sugar, and they do have the highest metabolisms of any animal, and they need to eat a lot all the time. So they do supplement that with uh, insects. And it's actually thought that hummingbirds evolved first as insect eaters that were probing flowers to look for little insects that were themselves pollinating or maybe stuck in some nectar. Um, and then they started uh, saying to themselves, wow, ah, this nectar stuff is tasty too. So anyway, their very acrobatic and quick flight allows them to uh, be great fly catchers, just like that other family of birds. It's the first largest family of birds, the tyrant fly catchers. So they're doing what's called hawking or fly catching. And so many of them do live near areas where there's water, like here along the Deschutes River, where year round we have um, midges erupting from the water and other types of insects, same ones that our trout and our salmon love to eat. And so they uh, provide a lot of protein. So a lot of times the females, when they're raising their young, will build their nests near the water sources so they can have that year round um, nectar. And here's uh, some more. Now, in this case, this uh, bird is just sitting here resting, <laughs> just looking at all those gnats around him. Oh, here's another video. This is from um, Monte Verde Cloud Forest in Costa Rica. Different species. Violet saber wing and a rufous tail hummingbird. You really will need to go to my website and listen to these because it's just a whole different experience to be able to hear the buzzing sound. <laughs> okay, so they've got to avoid predators too. Uh, even though they're really fast, they're not that fast. Everything has predators. And well, one of the um, yeah, spookiest kind of predators are boa constrictors. So I've actually seen this before in a bird watching lodge where the boa constrictors will hang out near the um, um, like near the, the deck where they have all the hummingbird feeders out, but there might be a few uh, shrubs where the birds are resting between feeding bouts. <laughs> but they are a natural native predator. Um, but also so are things like sometimes even larger dragonflies have been known to try to attack them and prey mantises. Now, a lot of times it is when they're perched or when the um, mother is sitting on her nest. 
not too many things can capture a hummingbird while it's um, flying. But <laughs> there is a species of raptor called the tiny hawk. That's actually the name of the species. And it specializes in hunting uh, hummingbirds. Okay, now of course they have flights for elaborate courtship displays. And so this is uh, one of those white pointed racket tails. And so the males are very aggressive, very territorial, and they're um, fighting with each other and they're to um, get territories and trying to show off to the females. Now, um, I mentioned earlier that they are not songbirds, but they kind of sing with their wings and their tail in that they have special structures on their wings and tails that allow them to make sounds that um, can both uh, attract uh, mates and scare off um, their predators. I mean, their com competitors. <laughs> so here's a really quick video. Uh, this is a this is actually a um, a hybrid between an Allen's and a Rufus down in Southern California, and he's doing what's called a shuttle courtship display, where he'll go back and forth really quickly. And again, I don't know if you can hear this, but it's uh, it's very loud when you're there. It's going <laughs> nine kilohertz ring wing trill created by narrow outer grinders. And this was filmed by Mr. Clark of it um, down at UC Riverside. Another reason I love hummingbirds, this reminded me, is I spent four summers in Colorado at the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab, and they study migrating hummingbirds, and they actually ban them. And then when they come back to um, breed in the spring, you know, they're reading their bands and collecting them and seeing how healthy they are. And they found some birds have returned five years in a row from going all the way to Central America for the winter and back. And they'll not only come back, but they will nest, a female will find the very same tree in like a aspen tree in the very same meadow to nest in every year. Isn't that amazing? So here's uh, another kind of visual picture here um, of the Allen's hummingbird, their dive and pendulum display. And there's this um, whining sound at the bottom that's produced primarily by the tail feathers number three and, oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> I think number four and five as well. And so, of course, too, they're showing off their iridescence. So, you know, when they're, um, when they're hovering and turning, uh, they will um, try to impress um, their mates or um, impress their competitors, too. And it's usually the males are more iridescent. But in the tropics, often the females are almost as iridescent. There's not as much difference um, in the sexes. So this is one really fancy ones. This is the only one in this whole slideshow I have actually seen, but I had to show you a picture. This is so beautiful. And they will purposely turn away or, or towards the sun on the right or away from the sun on the left to uh, you know, be dominant or not. You know, Just like a, a dog uh, will look at another dog to uh, be aggressive, but if he doesn't want to be aggressive, he'll turn away with his tail lines. Right, so hummingbirds know, you know, when when to fight, and, you know, when to li live for another day, fight to live for another day, right? So they will turn, and of course, they had to show the more of a local anas, which is those beautiful feathers. So our northern hemisphere hummingbirds are more iridescent in the males and more just in this gorget or throat region, and sometimes on the um, cap as well. So um, they're going to have flight for defending resources, both um, um, uh, food resources and kind of territories and mates. But then the females will fight as well. So it's not um, females. Yeah, they can be rowdy as well. And this is one of my favorite species I just recently saw in Costa Rica, the volcano hummingbird. And this is a female, and she's showing that lesser violet ear who's boss. And a lot of the hummingbirds are on the edges of the volcanoes. We'll talk about habitats next. And there's a great picture of how they can fly upside down. Now there's a few kinds of hummingbirds like a hermits, which don't do as much defending. Um, they're actually a kind of a 
ancestral lineage of the greater uh, Tropilidae family. And they happen to have a behavior called trap lining, which means that instead of defending a certain meadow of specific flowers, they'll go in a much bigger route around in, through the forest. And they'll remember all those flowers and they know in their head how long it takes to have that flower refill with nectar because there's this co-evolutionary relationship. So uh, flowers will make a very thin uh, dilute nectar that is um, released at just the right pace to make the hummingbird come back again and again so that there's more of a chance it's getting that pollen on his head and on its neck and gonna um, allow the flower to eventually set seed and make new flowers. So anyway, that's what these guys do. It's the long built hermit. And flight, of course, for migration. Now, lots of birds do that. Not all birds do it, and not all hummingbirds do it. But um, the, the longest distance uh, migrant, the first place champion, is the rufus. Um, and they um, will nest all the way up into southeast Alaska, uh, where you've got you know almost 20 hours a day of sun and insects to eat. <laughs> when I travel in the tropics, people are always asking me, aren't there a lot of insects? You know, do you breathe deep and all that stuff? And I say, you know, I need that a lot more in Alaska. <laughs> there are way more insects. And that's one of the benefits of migrating is they're gonna get all those daylight hours where it's nice and wet and marshy, and it's just an insect factory, especially of those tiny little gnats and midges that are their size. But then they go all the way down to Central America. So they have um, about three to 4,000 miles that they go, with tiny little rufus. And then another uh, second place <laughs> uh, winner is the ruby-throated hummingbird, and they migrate all the way across the Gulf of Mexico in one sprint. It's about 500 miles. They do it in about 20 hours. So that does require them to fly a bit at night. Hummingbirds are different from most um, migrating birds in that they uh, migrate during the day and they migrate alone. You know, they're not flocking birds. So why do you think they might migrate during the day instead of the night? Right, right. So um, she said when the flowers are open. <laughs> and so they have such a high metabolism, they've got to stop to be able to eat. Uh, just like when we're driving down to California, I got to stop at that In-N-Out burger, you know, when I finally get to Chico. <laughs> so um, they, uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a really long migration there. Do so they, yeah. Do they follow the coastline or do they fly over there? Both yeah, no, they, they jump across here, I believe, from here. And there's a lot of birds, especially this area is very famous also for watching raptors migrating. I've got friends who um, work here and they can have, you know, 100,000 migrants, raptors go over in a day. So, yeah, I, I think, but I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not a hummingbird biologist. I am a hummingbird enthusiast and general naturalist, but uh, I should know that answer. But anyway, so long flight and they don't all make it up, see. Um, but most species are sedentary, um, especially in the tropics where um, you've got food and warmth and water all season long uh, and the um, seasons don't vary much. So the violet saber wing, which is that one I showed you in the cloud forest of Monte Verde, is one of our larger hummingbirds. Uh, and um, they do have a bit of an altitudinal migration so a lot of these hummingbirds in the tropics are living on the slopes of volcanoes and they can go up a few thousand feet or down a few thousand feet as the weather changes or as the, um, the, the flowers are moving, like certain tree species will bloom and have 10,000 flowers on them. And a few days later, you go up the hill and that, that next tree will be flowering, so they'll follow that. And there's another one. <laughs> um, so... Uh, the Ecuadorian hill star. I was lucky to see this one up at 14,000 feet um, in the Andes of Ecuador. Um, and yeah, so it can get pretty um, harsh up there. So they've got to move as well. And there's not much cover to the trees. Um, well, there's not much tree cover, it's pretty dwarfed. Just these little um, spiny shrubs whose name I forgot. <laughs> 
So um, speaking of more tropical species, let's take our field trip now. So get your uh, hat on, your binoculars, your sunscreen, and we're going to see the diversity of hummingbirds and some of their habitats. And again, I'm focusing on Central America South because that's where I spent most of my time into most of the countries between Mexico and um, Peru. So starting in the north, the island endemics, where I first got inspired by hummingbirds. There's lots and lots of islands, and the hummingbirds will live from uh, the coast all the way up into the mountains, like the um, famous um, um, John Crow um, Mountains of uh, Jamaica. So, you know, hummingbirds have a wide range um, of latitudes and altitudes. And like I said before, there's 16 species that come through the Caribbean alone. And so here's one of them, that cute bee hummingbird. This is the smallest hummingbird. It only weighs about a penny. You had a U.S. copper penny. Isn't that amazing? And they've got an amazing gorget. It's kind of like our um, costas and calliopes. Another one I really love is the national bird of Jamaica, Jamaican streamer tail. And yeah, they live in these um, these uh, high mountains up in Jamaica, which Jamaica actually has the most endemic bird species of any island for its size in the world. About 30 species of birds that live nowhere else in the world. Purple-throated carib, and um, I painted this one. Uh, and it, it's really fun. To, um, this is a very unique kind of hummingbird. It's got this, um, what we call sexually dimorphic, uh, meaning they look different, um, not so much in color, but in the shape of the bill. And so the male has this straighter bill, and it tends to go to a different species of bromeliad than the female with this more arched bill that goes to a different species. Now, some hummingbirds live in the deserts, um, like in the Sonoran and Chihuahuan deserts of the U.S. and all the way down into Central and South America. And um, a lot of desert blooming flowers like Ocotillo and hummingbirds love lots of the cactus uh, species for pollinating. Like there's a costas, little tiny costas, and you can see it is facing away from the sun. It's being very... Um, muted in terms of its coloration. <laughs> it just wants to feed, it doesn't want to in, in, intimidate or press any girls, it's just hungry right now. So it's turning away from the sun. Um, now at the other end of the size spectrum from the one penny Cuban bee hummingbird is the giant hummingbird, aptly named. And I saw this one in Peru, also up in the Andes, but more of the in dry steppe lands, but still at about 10,000 feet, I think, outside of Cusco, Peru. Uh, this one weighs about 20 pennies. Can you imagine holding 20 pennies in your hand? Uh, Neotropical thorn scrub. So that's similar to uh, the desert. And uh, you wouldn't imagine that in such a sort of an ugly habitat, you would have such beautiful species like this black-tailed train bearer. The hummingbirds have such unique, evocative names. <laughs> you know, the amethyst and the emerald and the silk and the coronet and so many species that indicate how colorful they are or how beautiful their tail is. Now, lots of species are in the lowland rainforest. When you think about the tropics, um, you often think about rainforest, but that's a very actually small part of the habitat. But lowland rainforest near the coast, there are species like those hermits, uh, and this is pollinating heliconia that's really fuzzy. If you were to touch this, it would feel soft, almost like a kitty cat. It's amazing. Oh yeah, that's a video, here we go. Uh, a friend of mine sent this to me from, um, she lives in uh, Panama. It's the Rufus tail. You can see how tiny those feet are. <laughs> okay, and then the tropical foothills. So um, there are a lot of uh, mountain ranges and a lot of volcanism. There's the whole ranges of volcanoes going through Mexico and other parts of Central and South America. And as you go up from the foothills and up, again, you can see different species of birds, different suites of birds, 
a species every hundred yards or so as you're driving up around and around and around the top of the volcano. And so I spent a lot of time in this habitat just in May and June. I was down in Costa Rica for seven weeks helping to uh, kind of house sit a bird watching lodge. <laughs> and um, they had an endemic. So a lot of hummingbird species are endemic, like this aptly named snowcap and the tufted coquette. And the Jacobins, there's always lots and lots of Jacobins, very common widespread species, the white necked Jacobin. And a few others. And another video, my friend Charlotte in Panama. It's fun seeing them after the rain, they're gonna and like get their feathers up, dry off. Yeah, I mean, it's amazing how <laughs> they can fly in their rain still, too. And of course, it gets a little colder in the rain and they get even hungrier. So at the uh, lodges, it's just as busy in the rain. Going up in elevation, the mid-elevation cloud forest. I love these areas because they have so many epiphytes, all these um, bromeliads and mosses and lichens and orchids and even epiphytic cactus up in the trees. And where my favorites is a sword build. I sketched this one in Ecuador and this is a short little shaky cam video filmed with my cell phone. And again, if you could hear the humming of this, <laughs> you would just be so impressed. How long would that tongue have to be? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it goes all the way back to their throat. And it's um, it's a kind of a W-shaped tongue. Anyway, OK. Uh, another one I love was a fiery throated. You can see how they are. And I saw this guy also on the slopes of the volcanoes in Costa Rica. Tourmaline sun angel. Purple throated wood star. <laughs> Violet tailed silk. White booted racket tails. And I just love those little boots. They're very soft and fuzzy. And here we are uh, bird watching, and there's another species of really cool uh, tubular hummingbird flower. So again, they're excellent hummingbird. Humming, hummingbirds are excellent pollinators because they can pollinate when it's cold and wet when other um, insects can't. Violet ears, named after those beautiful feathers um, on your ear. It's easy to forget, um, but birds do have ears. <laughs> and there's a little hole there. There's no pin in it like we have, but there's a hole it's below the um, eye and behind it, and about as big as the eye as well. Great sapphire wing. Amethyst throated sun angel. And there's a great um, photo here where you can see how long those primary feathers are compared to this little block of secondaries. And that's one reason they are so agile in the sky. Some more sketches. Then going higher elevation. So you get to a certain point where you get above tree line, just like here in the Cascades. It gets just too cold, the growing season, and just too windy. and. Um, rainy and um, even snowy in some places. Uh, but so depending on where you are, they call this Paramo or Puma, Puna or Elfin Forests. And uh, this is one of my favorites from up there that I saw in Manu National Park in Peru, up, up above 12 or 14,000 feet. A shiny sunbeam that looks very plain and dull in the dark when it's cloudy and rainy. But when they turn just right, you see this amazing rainbow on their back. And just more of the habitat there. Those are some pictures from uh, Yamacocha Reserve in Ecuador. And then the Ecuadorian hill star we saw in the same habitats. 
as the Andean condor, which is nesting only a few miles from this site here. Sparkling violet here. And my friend took this photo, the rainbow bearded thornbill, photographed by my friend Sam Woods, who uh, works with tropical birding tours, the new tours all over the world. Great organization. Perfect. So um, before we take questions, I did just want to um, tell you that I've got an extensive uh, page on my website. I don't know if you can show that for me. Uh, just at my website, christineeller.com slash hummers. Because like I said, I'm not a hummingbird biologist. I just play one on TV. Um, and I don't know if you can scroll up, but I put a lot of resources, um, links to original research so that you can see, um, you know, if you want to learn more, scroll up. There's a, a lot of places that I've listed that you can see um, interviews from uh, researchers uh, and videos from BBC and all over the world. Uh, and then there's a lot more resources on my own website. And I also have online bird sketching courses, including one on hummingbirds and another one on neotropical birds. It includes a lot of the other families that are either exclusively um, or mostly in the tropics. So yeah, just check that out at christineelder.com slash hummers. And you'll see a lot of links to learn way more about the physiology um, of flight and you know, the anatomy of hummingbirds adapting that. So, can we take questions? Absolutely. Well, first off, thank you, Christine. Thank you so much. That was a really great overview of some just absolutely fantastic and fascinating birds. A whirlwind virtual tour of the tropics <laughs> from yeah. sea level to the top of the Andes. Yeah. So I hope you enjoyed that. Much better than the snow is looking outside in my opinion. But we are lucky to still have coming birds here. Does anyone in the audience have questions? You have some from online too. Dan. What the app do you recommend for identifying birds in the tropics or hummingbirds in particular? Oh yeah, uh, Merlin okay. is called, is one of them, yeah. Uh, and that one, um, yeah, now even has sounds you can use. And sometimes even if I've done a good enough sketch of a bird, I can take a photo of that and it will recognize that and tell me what species it is. So yeah, there are several um, apps that um, help you keep track of the birds you've seen and help you identify them. Yeah. So the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a great resource. Thank you. Um, yeah, um, You said that you have some hummingbirds around here in the middle. Yeah. What kind are they? Are they the roughest thing? Um, Anna's hummingbird is what I have mostly at my house, but we do have seven species. Um, I don't think the Rufus is around here. I haven't seen him now, but we have Calliope and Costas and the Black Chinned and, uh, yeah, probably the Anna's is the one that I have, that, that one that's a brilliantly pink, unfortunate. I do have one that's kind of hanging over um, close to the house um, so that it doesn't freeze as much. But I put an alarm on my phone every night to remember to bring the feeders in. Mm -hmm. I know there are fancier feeders that are heated somehow. I do have a heated um, bird uh, bath, <laughs> but I, I don't know about the hummingbird feeders. You're enjoying to see the birds. Yeah. Or do you put the feeder? It's well, my feeder, right, right. Well, feeders yeah. should be, um, you know, off the ground, obviously, away from cats. Um, in the summer, it's good if they're hanging in the shade a little bit more because the hummingbird nectar can um, go bad very quickly. But it's always great to have a, a backyard that has um, water resources and shade resources, perching resources. So the hummingbird will um, like to have a place they can perch and come back and forth and back and forth very quickly. So I've got two maple trees in my backyard that are only about 10 feet away from the hummingbird feeders. And so it's really easy for them to come back and forth. Um, so yeah, it just takes birds sometimes a while if, it's, if you haven't had the feeder out before maybe. Sometimes it's good to put something red, something really obvious, like some red fabric or something, because they key into that red very quickly. You can see that from farther distance. 
than maybe um, just a glass beater. Yeah. Yeah. So if you have them all winter, do they migrate some other time? Or do they stay at all? Right. So not, like I said, not all hummingbirds migrate. Or maybe oh. they might just migrate a few hundred miles um, in, in uh, latitude. Okay. So yeah, some species are here year round. And um, with climate change and with people um, planting more plants in their backyards and hanging more feeders, hummingbirds are up in like British Columbia even all year round. Um, and a lot of these resources are um, from this Al Schuler lab um, at the University of British Columbia, and um, they they found that. Yeah, to be true. Yes. I yes, have some funny stories about hummingbirds. Can you tell us one? Some funny stories. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, just fun. I mean, I just enjoy watching them. I, I haven't got a dive bomb me before if I'm wearing too much red when I'm out bird watching. They can just whiz right by your head really quickly. Um, oh, funny. That's Ever funny. been attacked by them? Because, <laughs> you know, when they go to feed, they're pretty Right, crazy. right, right. Yeah, no, but um, I have had them close and um, I've been able to hold uh, little uh, handheld hummingbird feeders and have hummingbirds come right to me. Um, so, yeah, I have to. I didn't think about that. Sorry, I can't think of that. I've got lots of funny stories about traveling and birds, but I don't know about hummingbirds. Yeah. yeah. I just asked because I had a hummingbird feeder not over a deck. Uh -huh. and the hummingbirds would do what you said when it was empty, they would let me know. Right. The window. And one day I had the door open and they flew right inside. Oh, yeah. Was <laughs> uh, oh, and, yes. Let me know. And it is tough to get them out of your house, especially if you have these kind of rafters. You know? Yeah. So a few kind of sciencey questions, if you will. Uh, I'll try. Yeah. How many eggs on average are laid in a year? Is it always the same? And are they tended by both the female and the male? Well, there's never any always in nature. Um, the female always raises the, the young by herself. So that's just the way that species works. Of course, um, that group of birds, of course, other um, birds, like of course your backyard robins, you always see um, the male and female working hard, but of course they have large clutches as well. So she usually lays two eggs and if she's lucky, she'll fledge both of them. There are some really fun nest cams online where you can, um, people have set up, you know, a camera in their backyard and gotten really great views. And you can watch the hummingbird raise her babies. Um, so, uh, yeah, if she's lucky, she'll pledge both of them. Um, yeah, it's always just the, the female. And what's the other question? Yeah. Uh, how many? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And two. What are they? Yeah. And then... Will the offspring migrate those distances, such as between the Gulf of Mexico and the United States? Will they migrate within their first year? How long does, what's the kind of um, age, you know, that they would actually leave and, and start doing that journey? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure if they go their first year. Some birds do, some birds don't. Mm -hmm. um, oh, there was another part of that first question I was going to what was that whole question? How many eggs are laid? Yeah, two eggs, just the female, and always the same number. Not always the same number. Depends on resources. There's another part of that question. Tended by both female and male. No, there's another part. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I forget. I knew the answer to that too. Um, yeah, forgot the other part of that question. Yes. About in the tropics, is there still only one clutch here? Or do they have oh, right, the number of clutches, that's it. Yeah, so the number of clutches does totally depend on resources and weather. Um, you know, like in my backyard, I've got pygmy nut hatches and a little box, and sometimes they'll do two or I think I've even seen three clutches of four or five babies. So it all depends on, on resources and weather. Um, yeah, and her health and her age probably. I mean, birds generally can live like up to five to seven years uh, if they're lucky. <laughs> so yeah, the female could do that several seasons. But yeah, it just depends on a variety of resources. Yeah.
Speaking of our backyard hummingbirds, someone said that they've had several hummingbirds stay quite long into the winter. They had a black chin who was here all last February and into March. Is that normal or were they lucky? I'm not sure about all. I, I know a lot more about tropical species. Um, but yeah, um, look at that up on the internet. <laughs> The website All About Birds, by also by the Cornell Lab for Ecology, is a great resource um, for um, migration and nesting behavior and and um, detecting uh, separating similar species and that kind of thing. Yeah. And they also ask if they have they have six feeders. Should they keep all of them out in the winter, or should it be safe to bring some in? You know, it just, I mean, it depends what kind of visitation you're getting and if you can handle them. Um, yeah, I mean, if, if the birds need it, they need it. I've seen them empty the feeders pretty quickly in the winter because they are hungry. Uh, you know, they need all those calories. Uh, uh, but having such high metabolism, they do have to go into what's called torpor um, in the winter time and also at higher elevations, which is actually sort of a, a state of deep sleep where their heart rate is reduced and they're almost dead <laughs> and they reawaken um, each morning. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, just as many feeders as you think you need. Hummingbirds are very territorial, so it does help um, if you have feeders, maybe to hang them farther away so that they don't spend as much time fighting over the feeder and they can spend more time actually getting that nutrition. Absolutely. And last question from our virtual audience, and we invite you to put more in also. Do you know if the hummingbird's body temperature varies very widely? It is pretty high. I think it's at least as high as humans. Um, and they have a really high metabolism. Uh, so yeah, mm -hmm. I think I did read that. About the and again, there's tons of other resources. That's why I made this whole web page for people watching. They can learn much more about other groups. Fantastic. Any more questions here for the audience? Any questions about travel or like field sketching? How I do that? I'm, gen I'm more of a general naturalist and traveling field sketching artist. <laughs> If you could pick only one place to go, because we have only so much time and resources ourselves, where would you say somebody should go? What, where should they go to enjoy the most? Oh, in terms of hummingbirds. Yeah. Um, definitely either Colombia or Ecuador. Mm -hmm. Again, that's where you're getting the most species and where you can go to some of these um, lodges, like the videos I showed to you, you can sit and enjoy your morning coffee and see 20 species before the morning is over. Um, so you get the most bang for your buck. And I even traveled during COVID, I felt very safe. Um, and all those Central and South American countries have very good reputations with great bird watching guides, bird watching lodges, which I can tell you about later. Um, and uh, yeah, so you shouldn't be afraid at all to travel in the tropics. And people are very um, safe and uh, friendly in most places. And yeah, just, and you don't even need good binoculars <laughs> for hummingbird watching because they've got the feeders right there at the edge of the deck. Wow. So it's great if you don't know, feel like you're the type of person who can hike out into the middle of the woods and you know go try to find some of those stealthier mm -hmm. like tanagers and mm -hmm. parents and things that are harder to see. Um, well, thank you, Christine. Again, one more time. This is wonderful. Yeah. Thank you so much for <laughs> trying to answer all the questions. All right. Thanks, well, virtual audience. Bye bye. Yeah. Check out theshootlibrary.org for all of the other great, fun, free presentations, and we hope to see you next time. Thank you.